everybody for coming to today's round bag. Um, this is the last of three round bags celebrating the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Trails Act. Um, Utah is lucky to have, let's see, four National Historic Trails crossing the Pony Express, which is the focus of today, the Mormon Pioneer Trail, which was the nation's first National Historic Trail, uh, the Oregon California Trail, or the Hastings Cutoff. And then the old Spanish Trail coming through the south end of the state. So April was kind of a warm up to the 50th anniversary, celebrating these important trails. There's also scenic trails that came through that act. So today we have Joe Hatch, who's going to present on the Pony Express and give a little context for the trails. But before we jump into that, I wanted to do two other things. If you really love trails and you want to continue learning about trails, uh, the Oregon California Trails Association Crossroads Chapter, which is the local Utah chapter, is hosting the National Convention here in Ogden on August 6th through 11th. We have Terry Welch, who's here. He's a co-planner of that organization. So if you have questions on that convention, please stop him. He has some postcards with more information. And you can also see a really cool map showing how Utah really was the crossroads for prehistoric through the historic period and even today. So check that out. So without further ado, let's get to the actual point of why you're here today. So we have Joe Hatch, who has spent a long time researching and working on the Pony Express. He's done the trail re-rides. Uh, every June, the Pony Express Association does a re-ride of the, the route from Sacramento. Uh, this year it's coming east. So it usually passes through Salt Lake in the middle of the night. So if you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning, go stand on State Street and watch the horses. Uh, but it's a great way to celebrate the National Park Service. I think this year, I don't know, Joe, if you know, they're going to usually have a tracker in the saddlebag. So you can go online and watch the progress of the trail re-ride as it moves across the United States to check that out. Uh, Joe also is the co-author of this little book, Pony Express Stations in Utah. He brought a few copies for sale up front for ten dollars a piece. So if you're interested in learning more about the Pony Express trails in Utah, feel free to grab one of these. Uh, he does not take personal checks or credit cards, so make sure to pay him cash. Personal checks are fine. Personal I just, checks are cash. Oh yeah. Okay. He trusts you more than I do. <laughs> um, so without further ado, Joe, I'll let you take it away. It's a pleasure to be here. I love the Pony Express and I love talking about it. <clears throat> On the personal check thing, I was in Damascus, Syria one day. My wife found some tablecloths that she thought were really nice. And we picked out a couple. <clears throat> I reached for my traveler's checks to pay for the cloths. Damascus, Syria. And that gentleman said, oh, traveler's checks. Don't you have a personal check? I said, I certainly do. And he said, that's what I want. I'm as trusting as he is. I'd like to talk a little bit about the national trail system and uh, how this is its 50th anniversary. <clears throat> I've been away to medical school and residency to become an eye physician and surgeon <clears throat> in Chicago and two years in the military and the army. And well, by the way, I had a horse. I've always had a horse available all my life. My father was born and raised in Heber City, and there was a pasture there. We still have that pasture, and another one that we used was for our horses. And uh, when I was in the Army, I not only got a horse, I started doing a little calf roping, and that was kind of fun. I enjoyed it. Now I enjoy my rodeo more than ever because I have a little glimpse into what some of some of that's like. It sort of helps to be able to be seated well on the, in the saddle with the Pony Express. There are moments that get sometimes a little exciting, and uh, <clears throat> that is helpful. Now, on, regarding the trails, in 1965, five years before, after I came back to Utah to, uh, to start my practice here in ophthalmology as an IMD, uh, President Leonard Johnson gave a talk, and he, when he talked, he gave a speech on conservation and preservation of natural beauty, and he urged Congress and the Department of the Interior to develop a program for a natural series of trails. <clears throat> and three years later, he had a bill. That's not really slow. Maybe it's kind of quick. 
I don't know how much controversy there might have been. Some people want to put their business in a certain place, whether there's a trail there or not, and it's wonderful to have a national system with some protection, some awareness of our great heritage. In 1968, the bill was signed by <clears throat> President Johnson, and that established the national trail system. That year, there were two, one in the Appalachian, one in the Pacific Crest. At that time, uh, 10 years later, President Jimmy Carter signed a bill, and that time it was an expansion of the act and established a category for National Historic Trails. And the, the Iditarod, the Lewis and Clark, the Oregon Trail, and the Mormon Pioneer were the four trails at that time. <clears throat> and since then, the years have passed, and uh, it's really, really done well. 50 years later, now we have 11 National Scenic and 19 National Historic Trails in excess of 50,000 miles of trail. And there are also 1,200 federally recognized National Recreation Trails. And uh, <clears throat> there's one thing that goes along with this, and the Pony Express, we fully understand volunteer hours. When we go out and do things with the trail, with the Pony Express and the other trails groups, we're supposed to declare how long we've been, how many miles we've traveled, and they translate it into, into dollars. And uh, this is a very meaningful way of taking care of things. There's going to be a great event, and I can't make it. Um, my wife passed away a month ago, and she had an annual event called the Dogwood Tea, and that ends up being exactly on the day. We're still going to have at least another one. <laughs> in her memory, and that's on the 5th of May, but there'll be a group going out in the West Desert, and we'll be doing some important stuff. The BLM is probably the driver behind that, and I, I look forward to it. That's the 5th of May, but anyway, those things, we, we should always, when we're doing things for the trails, and there's got to be a lot of trail people here, you want to make sure you remember how much you've done and uh, what it represents. <clears throat> In talking about the Pony Express stations in Utah, then Pat Hardy and I were both independently interested in the trails. He'd done a lot of research in the details of the stations. I, for a long time, had wanted a photograph of every station. We decided, and also, when one of the National Pony Express conventions was held in Utah, we took the trail from, um, from the Needles at the Barker Ranch, on through Salt Lake City, and had that for, for a uh, <clears throat> recreational activity during that convention. And Pat and I talked, and we thought, why don't we just go ahead and really get into it? So in this book, you have wonderful descriptions of every station. The nice thing about the stations is, as time passes by, we talked to old timers who aren't around anymore and got valuable information. As time passes, it's nice to know you have a nail for every station. And we're pretty good on where the trails are, too. Out in the West Desert, the trails are generally on graded roads. The Pony Express trails right on it. But anyway, for the stations, we know about it. So for each one in this book, there's a current photograph for every one of the station or what's left of it or the place where it was. As nearly as we know, some it's slightly vague, but most of them are pretty darn sure about it. And we also have the GPS coordinates for every one. This book's been on uh, three or four years. I don't remember just how many. <clears throat> we have not had any of the experts that we know exist in this community and elsewhere come forward and say, hey, we think you're kind of out in the woods on spotting this station. We, we haven't had anyone say you're nuts. So we must be pretty, pretty well right on. Let's just take a look at it. We'll talk about the, the need for speed. Okay, now there's been horse mail 2,500 years ago, Darius of Persia. The Roman Empire had 50,000 miles of paved road. And Kublai Khan was a bad guy. He was a conqueror, but when he conquered, he killed everybody. That way he didn't have any protest about anything. But he had horse mail. And in the American West, in the 19th century, 
If you want to send your mail from New York to San Francisco or Los Angeles, you go around the southern tip of South America, which was a tough voyage, by the way. You have 15,000 miles, six months. That's not very fast. <clears throat> the Isthmus of Panama is another one. There, there's some needle trains that go back and forth there. And that was two to three months, and that had a problem with malaria and yellow fever. And if you'd never had either one, just keep it that way. I was traveling to Africa on a LDS Church Vision Initiative thing, and they told me I needed yellow fever vaccination. I heard if you're over 60 or something, it might be rough to get it. I talked to a friend of mine about that. I said, what do you think? And he said, if you ever got the yellow fever, you'd wish you'd had that vaccination. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a tough situation, and still that's two to three months. The uh, Butterfield Stage Route, called the Oxbow Route, went from east to west, and like the Oxbow, the Hawkins had had under their chin with the yoke across the top, a big loop. And, it, and in 1857, just for the Pony Express of 1860, it was a 25-day thing. With the central route, which was discouraged by some, it ended up being it with Russell Majors and Waddell, allowed a 10-day travel with young men tough young men who were willing to take whatever happened. That means if you take your route from one home station to another and nobody's there to continue with the mail, guess who gets to take it? The one who brought it in. And you just keep going. And sometimes there have been rides up to 300 miles at a gallop. That's, that's a lot of horseback. Those kids are tough. Okay, here we are. I want to say a little something about things you find along the, at these station sites. This is the one station site where I was, a piece of pottery with a beautiful little rose on it. And I just dropped my card down there for size to show you. Here's what it is, and here's the site. Unless somebody picked it up since I was there, it's still there. You shouldn't pick up anything. Nothing of interest. And there's a terrible temptation to it. It's against the law, and it's not right. Let's protect what is out there, and what I'm telling you about will have uh, scattering of activity. You can tell that you're where the station was. The Needles is located barely in the Utah, the Utah-Wyoming border in Yellow Creek. This is Yellow Creek right here, this little stream. Doesn't look like much, does it? But I'll tell you, the ranchers have a deep respect for Yellow Creek because they can drive their pickup trucks through that and what they think is a good bottom and be down to the axles and do whatever they have to do from that point on to get their equipment back out of it. And not only that, I talked to a rancher who runs cattle on here. He showed me a wheel he found. He said, I found this whole wheel. It was a little bit showing. We, Moved stuff around and he brought it back to his ranch. I don't know. Once again, maybe you should try to leave it there and find somebody like the Utah Historical Society to take care of these things. But anyway, that's where it is. And why do they call it the needles? Well, look at those. Have you ever, have some of you seen the needles? A few. It's only about 10 miles south of, Wyoming, of uh, Evanston, Wyoming. You're on a state road. State road that kind of borders uh, Wyoming and Utah. And you can see the needles off to your left as you're headed south down there. And those are kind of conglomerate rocks. They call them like pudding stone. Uh, but, and they are not as high. Some of the higher ones might kind of show this one particularly. But uh, A.J. Barker, who lives there and has all his life, and the Barker's been there way over 100 years, said so they're not as tall as they used to be. And Sir Richard Burton talked about it when he came through as a tourist in the early, early, early days. And he talked about it. He was very impressed with that, and he was extremely impressed with Echo Canyon, and who wouldn't be? So there was a station there, 
That marker you see right here, Joe Nardoni, who is interested in the National Trail all the way from St. Joseph, Missouri, where the Patey House is, to, uh, <clears throat> to San Diego, puts up a marker that's about two inches square, really solid steel, and he welds onto it so he can read what's there. And it's, I don't know why people shoot at stuff like that, but it, it's hard to hard to destroy a Joe, Nard <laughs> Joe Nardoni marker. And although he's done a lot in a lot of states, by the way, this book's the only full state description of the Pony Express Trail within the state. There are five states with a lot of trail in it, and the other states either have very short trails or in Missouri, it's a couple of miles till you hit the bridge and you're gone. You're <laughs> it's in Kansas. But uh, there have been some structures there, and I understand. There's one that was thought to maybe represent the, the place where it was, but it was knocked over because, they, I don't know, the cattle grazing I don't know, by someone with the same last name as mine, but I don't think he's a very close relative, and it happened a long time ago. Okay, head of Echo. Let's drive from there. Now, when we could take the Pony Express from there, we go right from the Needle site and we stay on a dirt road for four miles till we hit the, oh, what's the exit? It's the uh, Wasatch exit off Interstate 80. And at that point, we get on Frontage Road. Most of, the, most of Echo Canyon we do on Frontage Road. Not that we can't, about 12 miles. We put the mochila in the pickup truck and it looks like the horses are going really fast. That tracker in the sky telling us <laughs> what the speed of the movement of the, of the tracker is. But anyway, here's, here's Head of Echo. Virginia Moore lives there, not in this house. She lives in something a little closer where I am from there. But this, this is on a well. By the way, if anyone has a question, wants to ask anything while we're going, just let me know and we can stop. Anyway, this is at a spring, and uh, we feel really good about this. And a lot of people wonder if that station wasn't a mile down canyon and so on, and uh, I don't think that anybody's too much thinking that, but I want to show you an archive picture. This is the Castle Rock part, but just notice what that looks like. And also think of, say, the curve of this, this little part here, this. And I'm going to show you an archive photo. And there we are. That's the set. first rock I showed you. We can go back and forth on that. Right here, it's got the little notches. You'd think it had changed some in the, since 1860, but it's very, very similar. And here's a spring. And this is the spring running away and the excess from the spring. But this is the stagecoach station at Head of Echo. Halfway is about halfway down Echo Canyon. And there's a Joe Nardini marker down by the road somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, it's right on, on that fence. However, maybe it's probably just a little bit off the picture. Pat and I are very impressed that this place is always green. It's kind of flat up there. We, we felt that there's a real possibility that the station was exactly there and this was the spring and there's still more moisture there. And let's look at the archive picture of that one. Look at a little, little bump here and you can sort of see the angle of that and a little hump here. See a few rocks showing in there. Here we come off the top, that little rounded part there, the rock showing in between, the contours. Very, very similar. And this is very good for supporting halfway. There's a little thing around the corner here, this little hanging rock thing. If you're on the, on the frontage road and you go barely past that point around the corner, it's really a little arch, a rock arch. Weaver Station. A little hard to pin that one down. We talked to Richard Richens. He's a, a Top Gun fighter pilot in uh, Vietnam. And uh, the Richens have lived around Echo for a long, long, over 100 years. Many Richens have. 
Richard Richards has a house south of the little echo stores and things that are there. And we went up and talked to him. He was so cordial, cordial and helpful to us. He has since passed away. I'm so glad we met him and talked to him. And this is Interstate 80 coming down. And here's where it goes off to 84. And here's the frontage road. And on the frontage road, there's some granite markers right here that talk about it being near the station. But Pulpit Rock was situated right through there, too. And the railroad had concerns. Maybe they thought maybe it would fall sometimes, kind of close to track. They wondered about the Weber River and what a problem that might be. And the Weber may be underneath, might be through here. I don't think it shows on this picture. But anyway, the Weber was moved to accommodate the railroad unless that's a little weaver there. Anyway, you can't decide where the station actually sat. We have some nice photographs of the weaver station. And in those photographs, you can see a little weaver river here, probably. And uh, the Richens' home is on a hump. Maybe it's right there, you? No, maybe up this hill. Probably this hill right here. You drive into there, and they have a... Well, they're the only house on that hill, but <clears throat> this is what it was. This is a big deal. They kind of had an amusement park there, too, but this is on the Weaver, and you can see this also where that station was from below. This is the Weaver. This is the mouth of Echo right there. And going back, the arrow points of where Richard Riches says, he said the Pony Express station was there. Well, okay, that's what he said, and that's where he put the GPS. And uh, he, it's within a nine iron shot of here where the granite is. And when you leave Colville and go across, take an overpass here, and head in to Interstate 84, this is, there's a, the Russian olive tree right there. It's not a really easy place to stop and check out, and there's nothing left showing of it. The, too much changed over the years, and that's what. <clears throat> Snyder's Mills and Alternate Station. It's an easy one to get to. If you, if you wonder about some of these, Snyder's Mill is right between Kimball Junction and Silver Creek Junction, just north of those two, a little closer to Kimball Junction. I have a diary that my grandfather wrote when he was 17, believe it or not, when he was 17, that was 1971. 1871, 1871. And he talked about stopping at Kimball's. He, he knew the people there. The, his father had the uh, Hebrew Exchange, if that wasn't the name of it then anyway, it was the mercantile store in Hebrew City. And there's a granite marker here. And it tells where he feels the Snyder's Mill was. I think it's the same Snyder as Snyderville, S-N-Y-D-E-R. But if the trail over the Big Mountain Saddle was snowed in, and it was in the winter of 1860-61, they used this as an alternate. This is on the Golden Pass Road anyway, from the mouth of Weber, well, the mouth of Echo Canyon, where the Weber River is, going through modern day uh, Colville and Wanship, and then from here on around over Party Summit on down into Salt Lake. Glen Wild is that little spot they call right there, and it's right on East Canyon Creek. Dixie Hollow. Okay, Dixie Hollow, there's a the road between East Canyon Reservoir and Hannaford. East Canyon Reservoir be just gone down the hollow a little further here and going back up over the hill gets you to Hannaford. The road goes through there. Right at the spot of this arrow, there is a marker put in by Joe Nardoni, which we agree with. And there's some stones that look like they were stones around the sort of foundation stones for a cabin. But not only that, John Eldridge, who loves this part of the trail, took it with us a little bit, said, there's an area through here 
He thinks it's surely a horse and mule corral because he's found shoes, horseshoes, mule shoes, farrier equipment, and stuff for shoeing them, and some of their materials. There's some people who say that they think that the Dixie Hall station is a little further down, but it doesn't make sense with all the evidence we have now. Bachman Station is right where the road, if you imagine the road <coughs> leaving East Canyon Reservoir and heading south, there's a place where that road turns right and you go on up over up Dutch Canyon and over the Big Mountain Saddle. This is right where those roads split. This is barely onto the dirt road. It was called the Clayton McFarland Ranch. It's now on the uh, Seventh Heaven Ranch, which Tim and Joan Fenton now own. This has been restored. This building, they written, I'll show you the signs, the things about it, but those logs are all the original logs of what was the Pony Express Station and used to be at a place they called Pig Spring. And then it was inside this building. This building was built over it, so it weathered because this building was over that cabin. And here it is. There's the old cowboy carpenter, and this guy was really something he did rebuild. He said he had to put about two new logs in on that spot right there. All the rest of it's the original log. And he put a final finish in. It looks like a bright new penny. Very shiny. And he had to put on a new roof. So he built it and put it on. And if you stop and look at how those logs fit together, it's just marvelous. Now here's where the cabin used to be, and this is an archive photo in this hallowed institution upstairs. And this one right here, but this has one door and one window. And the one we have is one, a window with a, a door with a window on each side. So something's inconsistent, but this is the place where Pig Springs would be. And taking a picture of that, Pig Spring area is right there. I'm not going to put his mark in there where we feel it is logical. We're very consistent with him, and he's, he's read our book, and he thinks it's okay anyway. He hasn't sent a letter of congratulations, but he, he said he wanted to do the whole trail and do all the work, and he's getting... Like I said, I've been getting a little older as the years pass, and so is Joe, and maybe some of you have. I don't think he has the, what it takes to put the final book out. That's what makes ours so fun. We have this with these stations so well described. Mountain Dell. He from Hanks. I had an uncle who was called Uncle Kay, and he married my Aunt Gwen, my mother's oldest sister. Later on, I found he had more than one initial. His initials were E.K. And he is my uncle. And Gwen's husband is the great-grandson of Ephraim K. Hanks. Guy I wish I'd known. I have a lot of admiration for that tough guy. But there is a spring here. They put some cement and sort of covered it over. But that seems to be the right place, and it is not under Little Dell Reservoir, we think. There have been BYU crews going in trying to find evidence before Little Dell was backed up all the way where the station might have been. There was the Girl Scout farmhouse. They wondered if that one of those buildings was part of it. But there's the spring, and if you turn around, turn you back to that spring, and look toward the lake, Here's a little Del Reservoir, you see the water over there, and there's an Ardoni post right there. We agree. Oh, here's a painting. This says, okay, this is Ethan A. K. Hanks, Mountain Dell Home. By the way, I wish I'd been turned on to the Pony Express when I knew Dick and K. Hanks, sons of Uncle E. K. And I said, Uncle E. K., would you please go to parties, can you show me who your great grandpa's? Well, your grandfather's, his grandfather's station was, because I think he would have known it without a doubt, but I don't know if anybody ever did that much. However, I stood there, and I looked at these mountains. Okay, there are those mountains. Okay, and then I looked that direction. You're looking north here. It's not like that, but... I've slept with an artist before she passed away, bless her heart. And artists do what they want in the background sometimes. If they wanted this kind of mountain, that's what they put in. 
And it wasn't necessarily exactly representational, but it's a cute way of painting, sort of fun. Salt Lake House. This was one classy hotel. And this is a, a beautiful home station with Pony Express. The way stations were 10, 12, 14 miles apart, and the, and the, uh, uh, the home stations, maybe 60 miles, they're a lot further apart, and you could get a meal and you could stay overnight, and it was, it was really nice. But behind this, more than back behind this, they had a place for livestock, and we feel it's where the Old Salt Lake Tribune building was at 143 South Main. So I wondered about the other side of the street, and uh, there's enough evidence we'll hang on where we are. Traveler's Rest, this is another one that's made because Traveler's Rest is right about where Interstate 215 hits Interstate 15. And if you think there's anything left there after all that road construction, forget it. But uh, there's a ink drawing of it. I'm, uh, I'm intrigued with this. And I think that stands for United States Building, Refining, and Mining Company. I'll bet you anything that's what it is. And this is sort of zzz, 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 but I think that's the Oak Horse. I think that's looking west. Here it is. And you don't have too much. I don't know if that's mountain top right there or not. but. That's what it looked like at one time. Again, that's from the archive photos here. We got some wonderful material here. It was great to help us. Rockwells. Nobody knew who Rockwells was. We, there were a lot of hunches. I w went there with a Rockwell, who was a grandson of Porter. And I'd been with him on a bus trip. I said, would you meet with me and show me where it is? And, we stood somewhere, this is, by the way, this is prison, this is the watchtower for the prison. This is state prison grounds right here. And we stood somewhere off down there and he pointed out, he had maybe something like here. He, he was close to what we think it was. But one day I was on the telephone with a historian from Lehigh and he said, Joe, guess what? They've been messing around with the bulldozers around Rockwell's. And they turned up a gazillion adobe bricks. What was made of adobe brick? I'll tell you what was. Porter Rockwell's barn was. Not only that, notice this barn. Notice how the, the uh, planks in the door come slanting down on this side and that way on the other. And the rock base and this little window and the lintel across, if that's the right word, across the top of the door of the barn. This barn was still standing. This is it, in 1950. I could have gone and taken a picture of it myself then, easily. But anyway, when they found lots and lots of adobe bricks, what else? I, who's positive, but who has some strong evidence? We took our GPS reading right where those adobe bricks were. And I think we're closer than anybody did. Now, there is a monument there. It's a monument, it's probably a CCC monument. And it says, okay, Rockwell Station. And it gives directions. It tells you how, how far west, north, whatever. The only problem is they moved the monument. And somebody may know where the monument used to be to see how good the directions are. But I still like our pile of adobe bricks. I think they mean a lot. Well, I'm thrilled about that one. Joe's dugout's very casual. It's hard to know. The uh, Nardoni markers down here. There's a road down this here. We just put it there to, just cause. <laughs> Took our GPS there, but we're within a half block of what Nardoni thinks. But, the thing is, Joe's Dugout was a place where you could see the valley of the Great Salt Lake, and then you could come up this way, and go over some mountains, and look into the valley where uh, Fairfield is. And so, a place somewhat like that. And they also had, they had a well there. This thought that maybe certain things had been thrown in the well. 
like even Desperado. I don't know. I don't know. I've never found out much about that well, but this is. And it, there was just a, a nice little notch where you, you didn't have to go over here. Over here is a nice little notch. And these are the mountains that are on the west of Cedar Fort, the city of Cedar Fort. Camp Floyd. The mayor of Fairfield lived in this house. At least he did when I was looking at it. And he said, yeah, I know where the Camp Floyd Pony Express Station was. He says, right under my boat. So I put the arrow right on his boat. And Nardoni's mark is there too. So, so it, it looks like that's it. And cute little old schoolhouse, one one room schoolhouse. We have some Pony Express meetings there. It's a wonderful place, wonderful place for kids to go and get a school experience. And just a block west from that is the Carson House, which is a, we're so lucky to have that and have it preserved. That's a stage station. And, it's a state park activity, and not too many things are still around, but that is. That's wonderful. East Rush Valley, really big here. CCC put this up, and everybody says, okay. <laughs> I took GPS readings there, and it's about the right distance from Camp Floyd. Um, a lot of these around, they, a lot of them had brass marks. This brass plate's gone. Looks like that one's still there. That has a horse and rider, so some of those have done better with the brass plates than others. And newer markers and different kinds are going up. Now, Rush Valley or Faust. Faust Station, the, the one, Faust was the station master. They called him Doc Faust. He had some health background and he helped with whatever and they called him Doc Faust and this is right on I'm not positive I think maybe it's State Highway 36 there's right there you nice pull off you can stop read the stuff there the actual station is a little bit further south than this it's in Tooele County property and there's a little lake there a little spring fed lake now, from that monument that I showed you, there's a road that goes across somewhere out here and goes on out toward the, <clears throat> toward the West Desert. But we don't always feel good about that. And after we made all those decisions and come to that conclusion, we walked around the other side of this lake one day, and Nardoni had a post there and down there too. I was always glad and wonder on the same page because he, he put a lot of hard work into all of what he did in all the states that he worked on. This is the Faust Station. It's an archive picture from the library. Not there anymore like that. Look out past, you're right, where you, right at the top of the pass where you can look out further to the West Desert out this way and you've come up the hill and Faust is back that way. And they have, there you can see both of those brass plates on there. How nice. Across the road, across the dirt road from there, you have, <clears throat> it's a little cemetery thing. There might have been some immigrants who have been buried there. And Porter Rockwell's brother, named Horace maybe, had a wife named Livy, I believe. And they lived there for a while. They were the station people. And <clears throat> Livy had some dogs. She thought the world of her dogs. And once one got sick, there were more, there's more than one story. But she sent an urgent call out that one of the people, one of the hands out there, the lookout, was really, really sick. And they needed a doctor to come in from Tooele, which is a ride. <laughs> Anyway, he came. They say he was kind of upset. The living, living slipped in a $20 gold piece, and that helped some. But she loved her dog. That's nice. Government Creek is between Lookout Pass and Simpson Springs, and that's a long piece. Too long for one rider going up a gallop. And they went at a gallop. By the way, we do. 
What we do, though, there are three sections in Utah, three trail groups, one, two, and three. And each trail group has around 20 riders. And each rider will take two rides of about two miles. And I've talked to people who said, is that all? Well, get on. Not only get on, get on. By the way, play with that all you want to. That's a mochila sitting on top of a saddle. That saddle is a Spanish-American War vintage saddle, very close to what the Pony Express saddle was, except it had a saddle horn in front of the Pony Express did. So, and it, but mochila is M-O-C-H-I-L-L-A, and the L-L isn't pronounced you, it's pronounced la, mochila. And it's Spanish for backpack. That's the backpack for the horse. It sits on top of the saddle. Or if you're sitting on there and your legs are hanging down, there's a fair chance when your feet are in the stirrups, you're getting banged by those front cantinas. The cantinas where the letters go in. And if you go two miles in a gallop, even a nice rocking horse gallop, you might feel you're getting worn out a little, you might start pulling that mochila to get it out of the way so you can finish your two miles. So, it's a pretty good ride. We love what we do. Uh, anyway, Government Creek, there's no evidence specifically of a creek, but look at the bend here. And I think maybe that used to be deeper and more significant, and every once in a while, in a storm, and you get a flash flood in there, and it'd be a pretty eerie experience. So we send it. it well, there was at least a telegraph station there. There's a scattering of artifact on the ground, colored glass. Obviously, it was in use for something. Simpson Springs. The uh, young people of Tooele High School, future farmers of America built this. This is the CCC's built this. It's the biggest, tallest one around. That's, none of the monuments are as big as that. But they built this, and it's really nice. Put a lot of logs in for the roof, and it's very nicely done. There's some thought that maybe the station is a couple of hundred yards that way. Anyway, that's right on the dirt road. It's beautiful. Well, I was taking these pictures I don't know why, but the clouds often seem to really be nice to me. They added some character to the puff on the top. I was pleased with that, just like that one. Riverbed said it maybe been on a former old bed of the Severe River, and uh, there is no artifact scattered. There's no total awareness. This is where the CCCs put it, so okay. That's the best we have. We'll go by that. This is also a riverbed by a drawing that somebody had, and I don't know what they were going on to make that drawing. That way, most everything I've shown you is right on a road somewhere. This one isn't. It's about a mile, mile and a half south of the road. But the road going through the desert here is out along here somewhere. And you, it almost helps, probably does help to use binoculars when you're up on that road to look down here and you can see the monument. And there is a dirt road going down. You take the dirt road down a ways and across, and you come right here, and you're right where, the, where that is. Black Rock Station. We know it's named for Black Rock because it's obvious what Black Rock is, this place. And, and the, uh, the Lincoln Highway went right by here. There's some sign stuff there. We've walked all over Heck, and there's very little no, and thanks, CCC, we just go on that. But anyway, it's, there's no other marker like that in the desert, so at least you know it's somewhere near there. Fish springs, the fish weren't big fish. The fish that were fish springs were two inches long. But there's a lot of marshland in there, and the marshland, this is looking west. And this marker is very near where the artifact scatter is. This Nardoni marker here is right where the GPS coordinates are in the book. And there's some pictures of this place, and I want to show you the pictures. Just remember again, look at the topography. Look at this thing, kind of pyramid shape. 
Remember that one. Here's another one, a little bit of pyramid shape on it. A little blip there, and here's a little double one. Okay. There's that first one. And here's that a second one, kind of pyramid shape. Here's that little double thing. We'll go back again. I'll show you one more time. Off to the side, the pyramid, that one hump, a little double hump. This one it fits all the contours. It makes you feel very, very comfortable about it. And there is a, <clears throat> it's a National Wildlife Refuge now, and there's a, there's a nice cabin there for whoever takes care of it. Boyd Station, still standing. Some of the descriptions say it's not rock, but it sure looks like rock to me. <laughs> this is Boyd Station. This is the right place. And this fence isn't just a square fence around it. There's a little bit of a zigzag to get into it. And the cattle, I've chased a lot of cows. <laughs> the cattle will not walk through the zigzag, the Z, to get into there. They leave it alone, thank heaven, because if they want to scratch and rub their back, they can knock over what little is left of it. And if there was more there before, because I'll show you an archive picture from another angle. shows you somebody in there. Here's somebody standing in there. You can see this is double his height anyway. They had trouble with the water there, and they dug a bunch of wells. They had one well that was so heavy on the saline, they used it for curing meat instead of drinking, because that's what it was good for. Everything wasn't really easy in the olden days. Willow Springs, lovely spots in Calio, Nevada. How many have been to Calio? Couple. You ought to go out there sometime. You think you're out in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden you get Calio, and there are green fields, and alfalfa's growing, and cottonwoods. And then, it's just a beautiful place. And by the way, in a lot of these places, if you want to go to see the station, you shouldn't talk to whoever owns the property. It's sometimes hard to find that, or who they are, or if they're at home, and everything else. But this is on Barker Ranch, and the home's right here. It's been a few years, and uh, I'm almost certain the name. The lovely lady who answered the door is Beth Anderson. Anyway, if you say, gee, I'm here, I'm so happy to be in Cali. Oh, understand you have a Pony Express station? She'll say, okay, and she'll take you out. And it's there. Right there, the monument's here, but the station's back. Actually, it's probably behind the monument. Now, here's a picture of the station, which is adobe and which is covered by wood, or else it would be gone, because the rain would have melted it away. Nardoni Post. But I love this. This is looking to the north, but I love looking west. I just love this picture. This is the door right into that little station from there. I love the logs and the wheel and those massive cottonwoods. Beautiful place. That's an archive picture of the drawing. That I can't piece that to anything. Round station wasn't really a horse's station, I don't think. You'd be starting up the canyon. And uh, the fun thing about Ron Station is you can walk right in and take a look at it, and it's got rifle ports in it. It's a long way from this rock to the far edge of that. So, and you, but you, you don't have a full 90 degrees, but you've got 60 degrees maybe to be in there and to defend it. They, they had troubles in the, in the canyon still further along. Colonel Connor attacked some Indians, and many Indians were killed, and the Indians were not happy. And they <clears throat> attacked one of the stations. They called it Burnt Station because it burned two or three times on up the canyon. But uh, that's pure retaliation for an unprovoked attack. I don't think there's anything that justifies <laughs> Colonel Connor and the California volunteers there or Bear River. Canyon Station is further up the canyon. This is not right on the dirt road. The dirt road is off to the side, off the right side some. And here is the CCC. But this thing's 
150, 200 yards away that there is an artifact scatter there. I know that that canyon station, at least at one time, was right where that arrow points. Deep Creek's the last one in Utah. I can't make a lot of sense of what it was and what they grew there, but they did have water. And that's another place with a lot of water and a lot of greenery. And this is, you probably heard of Howard Egan somewhere along the way. He was a, he had a ranch right here. They call it Deep Creek, not because of this deep water, but maybe it, the sides, the banks were deep somewhere. They aren't for the places where I went. The Kingston family owns this land. They graze it. If you stop there, there's a little trading post. It's a minimal trading post. You know, maybe one can of this somewhere and one can there. And they might, if you're lucky, have a few things Indian made. It's go shoot. And uh, but the lady there gets on the phone. She talks to me. She says, okay, you can go back in again. So we walk on in and take pictures there. And I love the picture of the Howard Egan cabin there. This is the same one. A little different angle. The Kingston's have felt that the trees were in their way and so they've taken them out, which is, I always thought they were pretty picturesque. This isn't a dash of color to enhance the photograph. It's red bailing twine just happened to be sitting there. This is the monument at Deep Creek. It gets in a different spot. It's not where the cabins are. It's maybe half a mile away. But uh, this one's interesting. It has kind of a beehive top rather than the kind of tops the other ones have. Well, when the telegraph came, it was the end of an era. This is a, an Ottinger painting and uh, shows the telegraph pole being installed and the rider gives him a wave. If you take a look here, there are two covered wagons there and there's a whole string of them out through here. So. Covered by it represents, this is not necessarily any place. But anyway, there is, by the way, Savage, the photographer, Nottinger, the painter, were friends. And Nottinger would often paint from Savage photographs, apparently. My family kind of ties in there, too. My Aunt Rowena Nottinger was the daughter of the great artist that did a lot of early Utah art. That's what I have. It's, uh, it's wonderful that we have preserved what we do have. People say, why don't you do the other states? That should be done by people who live there and can do it. And, uh, I'm just so glad we have it because somehow Pat Hardy and I got motivated. Well, enough people were alive, they could enhance our knowledge, and we had enough friends that we could talk things over and talk to them and see what they thought, see what we thought and come to sensible conclusions on this. So we made this book. I, I bought a greeting card the other day. It was really lovely. It cost $8, and it was nice the day it was given. If you want this, it's in the book, which costs $10. You can have it with you in the car or wherever you want. I'm not trying to sell it, but we have something special because there's nothing like it anywhere else. The states of Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and California are the ones with length of trails. And I might have mentioned Colorado, because I probably put one too many in Colorado. doesn't have a lot of length of trail. Nor does Kansas, nor does Missouri. But the other five do. So you're a wonderful audience. And so I've been looking forward to this, and I... Please to come, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. However, it's straight up one. <laughs> yes? Uh, did they ever just use all the existing buildings for their trails, or did they build cabins for each of the stops? The question is if the existing buildings were ever used, and uh, they. The, the only existing buildings that might have had some use is where there was already a stage station located there, but other than that, they had to build a lot of cabins, and if they didn't have wood, they used rock, and they did what they could. One of the most beautiful examples of an old structure of this vintage is very near Silver Creek Junction. It's on the Bittner Ranch now, which I think was on the Bittner Ranch in the 1860s. 
still is the same name probably for the ranch there, and it's barely north and barely east of the, um, let's see, not the Kimball Junction, the Sage Creek, of the Sage Creek interchange. So it's easier to see it if you're, if you're eastbound, coming over the Parley Summit through the valley, through the Parley's Park, Look at it, it's a wonderful colored redstone building in great shape. I think the bidders are glad to have it just like it is and won't be bothered with people going around. I'd love to get in sometime. That's one example of one. Any other questions? You're a marvelous audience, thank you.